Hello and welcome to this very special interview. Joining me today is Zia Modi, someone who needs no introduction in the field of law. Thank you very much, uh, Zia, for talking to Pleasure. us here on the courtroom. Let me start by asking you something about the manner in which corporate litigation, and when I say corporate litigation, I mean litigation which impacts corporates as well. It may not be strictly in the conventional form, uh, the litigation we were used to, uh, you know, thinking about between two companies fighting it out in court. Have you seen it ever in your life, the manner in which of the proportions it's taken today? I think uh, what is happening is that the stakes have just risen exponentially. So what was earlier um, a one crore dispute has now become a thousand crore dispute. And so I think when the stakes have been escalated to that extent, the sharpness and the acrimony which follows uh, has also escalated. So uh, it's been at a high fever pitch, I would say, for the last two, three years compared to maybe the decade before that. Um, I think it will go on uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, the world is not in the best place. And so desperate times call for desperate measures from people who cannot fulfill what otherwise they would have liked to fulfill in most times, their obligations. And you believe you're in desperate times right now? Overall? Uh, difficult times. Difficult, difficult times. Difficult times. Certainly, there's a lot of stress compared to what uh, was there a decade ago. Indian corporates are uh, clearly not, uh, you know, in the sunshine, uh, sunshine space that they were earlier. Uh, India Inc. is fighting to get its glamour back. Uh, you know, banks globally have their problems and not necessarily looking to rush to fund India. So certainly I would think India Inc. Uh, has to be even more nimble than before. Confident it will be, uh, but not without its stresses. And so therefore I think defaults will exceed uh, expectations. Uh, they will continue to happen and uh, that will lead to, as you say, high stake corporate litigation. How has the role of law firms such as yours changed in then in these two or three years? Have you become all pervasive now in terms of from not just being somebody who would step in when a litigation happens, but actually much before that and probably much after that? Yes, you're right. I think that, uh, you know, corporates have begun to realize that where they can draw on us is also strategic preemptive planning. Uh, so, for example, we've had companies come to us who have invested in Indian corporates who have issued FCCBs two years before maturity and said, assume a default. Okay. What do I need to get my ducks lined up now so that two years later I'm not scrambling? A preemptive strategy. Others come to us to basically say, okay, how do we use litigation as a defense? Uh, how do we start the correspondence forcing someone to litigate against us? Because then we get the sanctity of the delay of the court system. We're stuck in court, everything's sub judice, nothing we can do. Very recently, no less than the Chief Justice of India actually at a seminar at, in, in, on a public forum had to say that when it comes to corporate issues, economic issues, uh, there perhaps could be better understanding by judges themselves, and he made a very strong pitch for arbitration. Uh, because the, the point he was making is, A, economic issues uh, perhaps cannot be left unattended for very long, and sometimes judgments could affect them in a manner which probably the judiciary itself may not understand. Uh, we've been talking about this whole issue of whether we should have more commercial benches, economic benches, nothing really seems to have moved. Seeing the kind of litigation that we have, Zia, over the last couple of years, which has pretty much brought into its sphere a whole lot of issues. Uh, do you think the time has come now or India could lose out on one of its strongest pillars, which is the fact it's a democracy and the fact that the justice wheels move here? Do you think that could be a serious issue if we don't rectify this? I think it's been a serious issue for the last 20 years, frankly. I think the Chief Justice is just uh, being uh, frank. Uh, first of all, you know, the fact that justice is delayed is not a good thing for our system. The fact that, uh, you know, investment flows uh, to countries which have access to a prompt uh, judicial system is well known. 
uh, arbitration, which uh, has been a long uh, favored uh, measure of dispute resolution. Unfortunately, over the last 10 years, through a whole spate of uh, Supreme Court uh, pronouncements, has really lost its teeth. Uh, the Chief Justice, I think, was sitting on a bench which was reviewing an earlier decision. And hopefully we will see a pro-arbitration judgment. Commercial courts have been on the anvil. They say the commercial courts bill will be passed. I think even if it is passed, we're looking for at least five to seven years of judicial familiarity and training so that the courts become more specialized and understand it. See, in a way, you can't even blame the judiciary because in what situations did they understand or did they need to understand what the Foreign Exchange Management Act was? There weren't a hundred cases coming up. The hundred cases coming up were transfer of property, sale of goods. People come from the district court. You don't normally get FEMA there. So really what is key, and I think obviously there is an institute in Bhopal, and I think Justice Chandrachud has also started a good institute in Navi Mumbai, or is uh, mentoring it, uh, is to train the commercial judges about these different type of situations that can come about. Today, you do have a set of judges who have heard SEBI issues more often, quite familiar with it. But they are not guaranteed to be the ones that hear it every time. So you go to a new judge, you start the training process all over again from the bar at the expense sometimes of the client who will not get the level of sophistication that he would otherwise have expected. So I think commercial courts, I'm told, will happen soon, but I don't see the effect coming till people are invested, the judiciary is invested in that. I think things like, you know, competition law, let's say that goes to the Supreme Court from the tribunal. How many judges really would understand today the sophistication of the economic theories behind it? We, we grapple quite often. Surely so would the judiciary. So again, I think that, you know, uh, we have to accept that this is a joint learning. It's just that when the learning is given, the domain should be retained and not frittered away between too many for, for, for you know, those sort of cases. So I think it will happen, but like all things in India, the <laughs> elephant moves uh, slowly. Zia, how severe, according to you, was the reaction among foreign investors, when I say foreign investors, I mean both FII's portfolio, FDI, to the two developments that made headlines post the budget. Uh, and without getting into specifics of them, but there were concerns on the fact that the whole GAR rules brought in a sense of uncertainty, were not clear, and investors like clarity. The second issue, again, without getting into the specifics of it, was to change a law once the highest it. court has passed a verdict. Uh, how severe? I mean, I'm sure a lot of your clients got on the phone with you to try and understand what this really meant. Do you think somewhere the entire system never anticipated that on these two issues we actually ended up creating a lot of concern among global investors? It wasn't really about X company or X uh, FII. It was more <coughs> on principles. Do you think we went five steps back in projecting ourselves as a country that respected the law? Do you hold that view? I mean, I've been extremely unhappy about both these two developments personally. I just didn't think they were called for or necessary at this time. I think that what many of us have been doing, myself uh, not uh, excluded at all, is when we travel to meet clients or speak at conferences, we just end up trying to justify what India is doing. Rather than actually go for the issue that we want to talk about or the advocacy we want to do globally, Everybody is talking about, particularly these two issues, with a sense of bewilderment, uh, not what's the plot all about. Um, I think that, to my mind, perhaps uh, Finmin really didn't anticipate the pushback that it would get. Uh, there's some modeling that I think uh, some consultancy firms have done which say that by trying to collect the amount of money from Vodafone and some more through the retroactive amendment, India is supposed to have lost $90 billion over the next three years or five years, I forget which one, of fresh foreign investment. 
I think that we did not anticipate that money moves easily, that there are alternative options, and that if you leave an investor hanging without telling him how he is going to exit or what the rules of the game are, and frankly, more important than that, changing the rules of the game, you see, we might say that, you know, there have been other retrospective amendments and other countries have done it. It's not consequential. The timing was unfortunately wrong. Uh, the impact was severe. The principle was wrong. Yeah. And there was, in my mind, no need. All this could have been done prospectively. We were not going to go broke. Uh, we would have attracted much more certainty and therefore investment. And today now, having put out a set of uh, rules, uh, I think we are struggling to find an elegant way to dilute them. Um, to my mind, we should just basically talk to the stakeholders, have a bold government. It has nothing to lose at this time, if you ask me. And come out with a set of guidelines that are fair, transparent. Okay, if you need to tax, tell everybody the basis on which you tax. But if you have vague phrases and va vague words and, you know, uh, the litigation is going to be the norm rather the, than the exception, then people on the other side of the world can't justify what they're going to end up getting. And if that's the case, what was guaranteed once to be coming India's way will now have to be fought for. That's the concern. Let's talk a little about another very major verdict or two or three of them that we saw coming out of the CCI. Do you think, Zia, going forward, the whole context and the contours of competition law and how it applies to India? We lived with an MRTPC and uh, it had very little teeth, really. Today, if you actually have a situation where a lawyer is sitting into an, uh, an industry association's meeting, it shows that at least there is some sensitivity or acceptance in corporate India that, hang on, this is not something that I should be doing. But clearly, it's early days, according to you, and how do you see it evolving, the entire competition law situation in India? Well, I think the fine made everybody sit up, for sure. Uh, these sort of numbers, when you start imposing on corporates, obviously, they're going to look and take their situation quite seriously. In fact, I was talking this morning to a couple of clients, basically saying, you know, What's your behavioral pattern like? Uh, how do you deal with your distributors? What is your purchasing pattern? Are you talking in an association? Um, all these sort of issues now, I think companies have to introspect very clearly and very quickly. Um, I think that, you know, the uh, Competition Commission is going to have uh, a large role to play. Uh, I think uh, we've accepted that it's here to stay. And apart from just the combination and mergers and acquisitions uh, area, I think they're going to have a lot more to say in the behavioral pattern of uh, verticals, horizontals, bid rigging, cartelization. That sort of uh, behavior is going to come under strict scrutiny. Um, so I think uh, companies are very alive to it. Um, some more than others, obviously. But as lawyers, certainly, uh, we are constantly sensitizing clients in uh, their dealings. You know, have you looked at this part? Have you looked at that part? I think the Competition Commission sometimes has gone overboard in the quantum of fines. I think there will be a scale back. I think... Um, and a lot of this would get tested. Yeah, going sure. Forward. Nobody's going to pay it out sure. and say thank you very much. Maybe a bit of it was shock value. Uh, maybe a bit of it was to get attention. But uh, I think that uh, there will be large fines. And if there are cartels and bid rigging situations, I think you can expect large fines. So I think that again, over five to seven years, you will see more competitive behavior in the market because it will be too expensive to misbehave. Zia, how concerned are you about a sense of fear psychosis that exists within corporates today? That or perhaps even within the bureaucracy today, that if I am going to put my signature on something or if I'm going to take a decision on anything, I might be put behind bars, uh, not be given bail, and be you know sitting there for a while. Do you think that has kind of abated? Do you think as a system we went overboard on that entire thing and it just became uh, almost every corporate I spoke to was of the view that, you know, we are really scared. If you ask us, this is the issue, this is the issue, I don't know when tomorrow I'm just going to be locked up and put behind bars. Was that perhaps one of 
the more uglier phases in India Inc.'s history that we went through over the last couple of years? Well, you know, I often say fear is good. Nothing wrong with a bit of fear. It keeps you from misbehaving too much. So, um, I think that, you know, if uh, people are thinking twice about what they're doing and asked to sign and put their John Hancock on and what will be the consequences, that's good. They should be thinking. And if they don't like it, they shouldn't be signing it. So I've had a couple of uh, CEOs who have come to me and said, you know, I'm not going to sign. It's the promoter owns the company. Let him sign. And frankly, in one or two cases, I phoned the promoter and said, you sign. Mm. Why are you asking this guy to sign? Because the wealth is yours. The accountability is his. There's a mismatch here. Either you're comfortable and you sign or co-sign or don't make him sign. It's not fair. So I think that uh, the whole uh, putting senior executives in jail has suddenly uh, jolted India Inc. That having been said, I think that, you know, people have become cautious, sometimes over cautious. The downside of all this, according to me, is that I have talked to a lot of Indian, not a lot, some Indian promoters and clients who have said, we don't want to invest in India. We'll take our money outside. Serious. That's not good. That is very desponding, uh, despondent uh, behavior because, you know, after all, you want the energy of the Indian in India. You want uh, his asset and value creation in India. Uh, and rightly or wrongly, and it's not always wrongly, he, if he feels harassed, if he feels that, you know, he has to look over his shoulder all the time, if he feels that, if he has witnessed a friend who has gone through hell, it's infected him, impacted him. And if he's taking his energy outside, I think that's very bad because that, that calls on our long-term growth. If our entrepreneurs and our young generation of promoters is going to say, forget this country, then we have a problem. Not that it's in droves, but it's, even if it's a small enough bunch, it's not something you want. Right. I, I want to uh, talk to you a little about another issue which uh, got headlines recently and I know it's something very close to your heart for the last two decades. You've studied that issue very closely, is the entire insider trading issue. We've seen some uh, very significant orders being passed in the US uh, and being discussed yet in the Indian context. There are questions raised that why are we never able to, uh, you know, achieve such convictions or achieve such final orders. In fact, uh, and I, I want to get your thought on this. Is it regulatory incapability? Or would you say sometimes, again, because we did have one very high profile case 14 years ago, the matter hasn't even been concluded by the Bombay High Court. I don't even know whether a few hearings at all have happened in that matter. Uh, where is the problem? Where, where, according to you, is the problem? Is it in the investigation? Is it in the charge sheet that is brought to the court? Is it in the manner in which that, you know, you're at the end of the day going to a metropolitan magistrate's court and filing a criminal uh, complaint? We haven't really honestly seen any anybody going behind bars or being arrested for a serious crime as insider trading is. Why do you think that has happened? Well, you look at the U.S. history. Insider trading has got this phenomenal publicity and success story only when wiretapping happened. Right. Um, before that, where were the insider trading convictions in the U.S. either? It's a very, very difficult thing to prove. Um, SEBI, I don't think, has started they wiretapping. Don't. They're not allowed to. Uh, so therefore, uh, the real issue is, insider trading globally has never been successful to bring to the table for prosecution, simply because the lack of absolute proof. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence, but very little proof. So SEBI, I think, will have to have a, a, a better mechanism for investigation, like the SEC has got so far. The other thing is that uh, for a long time, the consent order system meant that if you got a show cause for insider trading, many people would like to just bring a quietus to the matter, whether they were guilty or not, just to say, you know, let's get this out of my uh, horizon by entering into consent terms. SEBI now under the new consent guidelines will not allow Do you welcome insider. That? I think it's a good thing. I don't think that, uh, I mean, philosophically, it's a good thing. I think the the downside is that there will be a lot of mental space wasted of SEBI uh, for smaller issues. I think it was open for SEBI always 
uh, as it was under the earlier regime, that if there were certain cases they spiritually didn't feel should be settled with money, it was open for them not to. So why fetter yourself and say, I cannot, rather than I shall not? I would have thought that the flexibility that Sebi would have had earlier would have been better served for them. But if this is the thinking, so be it. You cannot fault somebody for saying, I don't want to take money for somebody who's manipulated the market or traded. But there can be issues ranging from $100 to a $1 billion. Are you going to go after all of them? Do you have the mental bandwidth to do that? So I think that, uh, you know, the consent orders having stopped, uh, hopefully with a better mechanism. Uh, SEBI is excellent at uh, trying to piece together mobile records. So you often see show cause notices uh, which come with, uh, here's your call to me, my call to him, his call to her. Which and then again there's can a be trade. only circumstantial evidence. But that's circumstantial. circumstantial. But SEBI, you know, SEBI is probably going to take the view that we'll pass the order on circumstantial evidence when it's strong and let them appeal it and let's see what our track record looks like in the absence of anything else. SEBI may also want to uh, uh, set a minimum standard so that uh, the marketplace, again, the fear psychosis, it's better not to get involved in all this and just stay away from insider trading. It's a slow process. I don't think, I think the SEC has come of age after decades. You're willing to give SEBI more time on this? I think so. Mm. My final question to you. What is the mood among foreign investors as of today? Look at the private equity space. There are many of them grappling with this whole put-in call option where again there is so much uncertainty. You entered into a certain contract midway without any clarity or so. I do understand SEBI is trying at least on its part. We're not sure what the RBI's final stand is. The ministry wants to sort it out. But confusion till such time that Completely. is sorted. And then you have the entire FII issue where again now of course there is some time up till 2013 and the Prime Minister stepped That's in. not far away. That's not far away. What's the mood among them? Are they willing to even cut a check right now, Zia, or are they telling you we want to wait? No. There are some that will cut a check, for sure. Some. But not as many as would have done two years ago, three years ago. I think that the ones that cut a check know India. They're, as I call them, Indianized. Okay. Uh, they've <laughs> learned to live with uh, our grey views of the world everywhere. They've taken the India risk. They've digested that as part of the uh, IRR. Uh, but, uh, you know, many of them who would have invested $100 are now investing maybe $30 or $20. Their allocation has changed. Their prioritization has changed. Earlier, you had a lot of private equity in infrastructure They're willing to commit long term. I'm not sure that would be the case today. Uh, so I think uh, certainly the India story is tarnished for sure. Uh, I'm an optimist that, you know, I don't think that it's uh, for good or for long term. I think it's uh, short term to less than mid term. Uh, but that only if the government understands, and I think it does appreciate, that you just have to do a few things to get the mood better. Otherwise, again, we will be faced with crisis. And we cannot be a country that lops from crisis to crisis to reform and grow. That just is not correct. So I see that, uh, you know, a cautious thing, but not a turn away from India.